Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. I hope you uh, dried off, changed out of your swimsuit, and are just enjoying being together. Uh, we're excited you're worshiping with us because we're talking about, uh, or asking questions, rather, of God. We're in the middle of a series. We're asking, is God, and kind of fill in the blank. And this week we're asking, is God accepting? Does he accept me? Does he, is he a God that accepts people? That's a really important question. We want to be accepted. I know we do. We are dressing the way that we dress to be accepted by someone. You want somebody to think you look nice, think you look cool, think you look up to date, right? You are, we want to be accepted by other people because of, based on what we say. You might be sitting near somebody that has the ugliest shoes you have ever seen in your life, and you won't say a word about it. Not to them, anyway. You're going to be like, hey, look at those shoes. Because we want to be accepting. We want people to accept us. That's unacceptable conversation. You don't say that, right? How many of us have conversations with our kids about what's acceptable conversation at the dinner table? Or even what's acceptable for us to do in church? You can't run in church. If that's true, why did they make the hallways so straight and so long? <laughs> we want to be accepted. And this week, uh, as I was working on this, I got to thinking about a story that my mom and I read a lot when I was a kid, and, and we still talk about it. It's the Velveteen Rabbit. Anybody familiar with the Velveteen Rabbit story? Uh, it, it took me a minute. I had to go back and think about it. But uh, it's basically a story of, of a little boy who gets some toys. I think it's either for his birthday or for Christmas. And he gets uh, one of them is a Velveteen Rabbit. And at first, he doesn't really care about it. He kind of sets it aside. But then he gets sick. And it's the only toy he really can play with. And so he loves on it. It really becomes his companion. And he starts doing everything with it. And he gets, he gets loved on so much that, that the, eye, the button eye starts falling off. And he gets real ragged and worn down. And the Velveteen Rabbit winds up having a conversation with another toy called the Skin Horse. And the Skin Horse tells him that when you become real, you can become real as a toy. And what this is, it means that you are a, a so loved, so cherished, and so worn that you become as real to the child who loves you. And that's what we want. We want to be so accepted, so cared for by our Creator that no matter what buttons are falling off of us, no matter how worn out we are, no matter how, we, how broken we are as people, we still want to know that God accepts us, that God uh, wants to, to have a conversation with us. He wants to uh, receive us more than we, we want to know that other people do that. And today I want us to talk about that. I want us to talk about whether or not God accepts us. And I want us to look at 2 Peter 1, 2 through 11. We will never be today in 1 Peter. So if I mess up and I say 1 Peter, I just mean 2 Peter. That's where we're at, okay? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. And I want to see three qualities of God's acceptance of us. And the first is he accepts us unexpectedly. He accepts us unexpectedly. Look at verse 2 of 2 Peter, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire." because of sinful desire. It's right there. I feel like I've got like R2-D2 just kind of rolling out here and rolling back. Boop, 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 boop. It's really good. All right, so let's, let's break this down and talk about what's happening because uh, initially it sounds really, really good. So the first thing that he says is, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's awesome because what Peter's telling us is that God has already given us grace and peace and now he's gonna give us more of it. He's praying that God will just continue to pour out grace and peace. That sounds awesome. In the knowledge, so this knowledge of God means that we can get to know God. We can draw close to him. We can, under, we can, we can understand part of him. He can understand us, right? And of Jesus, our Lord, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The word godliness is really important. We're going to pick it up again later uh, in the next point. But everything that we need to be full 
full life, everything you need to have an excellent life, a flourishing life, you will find in him through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted us his precious and very great promises. What promises? What promises is he talking about? Well, it tells us you may become partakers in the divine nature. Wow, partakers of the divine nature. Now you might read this and you might think to yourself, well, does that mean like, after I die, I kind of lose my identity and I get sucked up into some sort of cosmic godness and I am uh, part of like some corporate thing. No, no, you don't lose your identity. It's also not, you don't become a god either, right? So it's not, you don't become completely subsumed under God. You also do not become completely independent of him. You take on some of his qualities, his natures, his perfect righteousness, his holiness. We, we, we get changed, we get transformed. And when you read that, and you read up until the, the, the second half of the, first, of the fourth verse, you think, this sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good. It sounds like God is, is appreciating me for what I am. I, I'm, his creature, I'm his creature, and that sounds really nice, and that sounds really good, and he's appreciating me for what I am. We're not equals, but much like meeting a celebrity. You know when you meet a really nice celebrity? And they're patient, and they sign the autographs, and they're like, hey, yeah, it's really nice to meet you. I'm so glad you're a fan. Like, you're in two different worlds. They are a celebrity and you are not. But they're really gracious and nice and you like that. And that's how we feel like we interact with God. We're like, oh, like he's condescending to us. That's really sweet on my own merits. And then you read the second half and it's jarring. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And you read that and you think, oh man, like if I, if I want to keep being optimistic, I can say, well, maybe I'm not the corrupted one. The world around me is bad, but like snow that falls from heaven, it's pure, it's white, it's nice. And then all of a sudden it gets dirty when it falls on the ground. Maybe that's how we are. We just get kind of tainted by the world around us. Or like uh, survivors on the Titanic, right? They get wet, they get cold, but we're just waiting for God to like pull up in the ship and, and rescue us, which was called the Carpathia, by the way. That was the ship that rescued people from the Titanic. If you have a trivia night, there you go. You're welcome. Impress people at a meeting. And that works. That really does work, except for two words here at the end. Sinful desire. You see, every single one of us, we don't just have desires. There's nothing wrong with desires. There's nothing wrong with wants. We have sinful desires. Sinful desires that put our wants, our needs, as the most important thing in the universe. It is 1115, and some of you are hungry. And the most important thing right now is me finishing so that you can get food. <laughs> I walked into that. We have selfish, self-centered desires. Have you ever, have you ever looked at somebody else's success and thought, I should have that? Like, how did they get to that position? They clearly aren't as smart as me. They're clearly not as good at this as me. I, I, da, 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 I have more credentials. Have you ever looked at somebody's spouse and thought, I wish my spouse was like that. I wish my spouse looked like that or acted like that. Congratulations, you've coveted. We never talk about it. I've never had anybody walk into my office broken down in tears being like, I just can't stop coveting. Because we do it all the time. We are a covetous society. We, we compare ourselves. We call it ambition, right? We just look at other people and we're like, I'm going to climb the ladder. Well, guess what? The ladder climbing happens in relation to other people, right? Like that's what establishes the ladder. There's not a real physical ladder. If somebody's told you that, they're wrong. So we have selfish desires. And what you might say, sorry, we have self-centered desires because some people will tell you, oh, that's just being selfish. It's not being selfish. Selfishness is pathological, okay? Selfishness is... I look at what happens in somebody's life and I want what I want and I'm going to run over whoever I can to get whatever it is that I want. It doesn't matter. Even if somebody says, hey, you're, you're hurting my feelings. You're like, I don't care. We're not selfish, so it's okay. We're self-centered. And there's a big difference. Self-centered people typically, if it's brought to their attention that what they're doing is harmful, they'll be like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it. But the very fact that we don't realize it shows where we put ourselves in our own little universe, the center of it. Right? That's why it's self-centered. I found on the internet this week some qualities of what self-centeredness might look like. One, they usually dominate the conversation. So I'm going to be self-centered for like the next 25 minutes. I hope you're okay. They lack empathy. 
They like empathy. They look at what happens to other people and they just can't identify with it. They often take more than they give. They want things done their way. They often blame others and they rarely take responsibility. And then lastly, they want to be the center of attention. Now, some of you are sitting here and you're like, Travis, I have fantastic news. I am a type B introvert and I'm never any of these things. I'm never self-centered because I don't want the attention. I don't dominate conversations. In fact, I'm the one that gets overwhelmed by how many people talk to me. I'm constantly empathizing with other people because I'm embarrassed for how much they talk. (laughs) And I am so thrilled that your interactions with the rest of us mortals are so great. How do you do in your interactions with the Lord? What about your conversations with him? Let's go back through the list. Do you dominate your conversations with God? In your prayers, do you just talk about you the whole time? Most of us do. Are you rarely concerned with the pain that your behavior calls, causes your creator? Do you apologize because, uh, do you confess your sin? Not because it's hurt him, but do you confess your sin because you don't want to get like punished? The, la- the third one, I mean, we all do this. We certainly take more from God than we give to him. I think that's just by nature being a creature, right? Do you want your way more than you want God's way? Do you demand that you get things your way of him? Do you find yourself blaming God for your circumstances and not taking responsibility? Do you find yourself telling the Lord, God, if you hadn't made me this way, if you hadn't created me the way, if you hadn't given me this disability, if you hadn't given me this mental illness, if you hadn't done this, this, and this, I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in. This is your fault. Now, we might not say it exactly like that, but how many of us take the things that are innate about our qualities, things that we wish we weren't like, And we say, God, if you hadn't made me, if I wasn't like this, I'd be a lot better of a person. Scripture says, why does the jar say to the the, the potter, why have you made me this way? Do you find yourself blaming him? Do your thoughts about God just really reflect your thoughts about you? Do you find God agrees with you a lot? Does God like the same people you like, hate the same people you hate? I've got bad news. It's not God. It's you. And this explains to us why God's acceptance of us is so unexpected. Because do you know what we do with self-centered people? What do we do with self-centered people? We get in the boot. We move on from them. How many counselors and therapists and self-help books tell you to cut toxic people out of your life? Why? Because much like a great old Western, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. There can't be two self-centered people in this world. And so we move on from people. We don't want to be around self-centered people. And you know what God does? God says, I do want to be around you. I do want to accept you. I do want to draw you close. And he doesn't just want to be friends with us. This is the amazing thing. He wants us as a part of his family. Like it's one thing to be friends or work with somebody who's self-centered. You know, you're like, okay, fine. My neighbor's kind of selfish, whatever. But to make somebody a part of your family, how many of us actively go out of our way to be in a family with somebody who is self-centered. Some of you are like, well, I don't really have a choice. How often do you see that person, really? You're like, well, I'm married to him. I see him all the time. (laughs) That's a conversation for you two to have. (laughs) And God makes us a part of his family. He draws us in. He draws close to us, despite the fact that we are so self-centered, despite the fact that we can't get out of our own way. Why does he do this? What is it about God that makes him like this? Do you know the expression, God's ways are not our ways? Have you ever heard this? Right. We use it a lot when people, uh, when somebody gets sick uh, or something bad happens and we're, we just don't understand the purpose of it. And we're like, oh, that's God's plan. God's ways are not our ways. You know, That's actually not the best use because that's not how the verse works. Let's look at Isaiah 55, where it comes from. This is Isaiah 55, six, which is one of my favorite passages in scripture. Isaiah 55 is amazing. God says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near and let the wicked forsake his way. It's the wicked he's talking to, the unrighteous man, his thoughts. Why? Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways 
and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He's talking about acceptance here. And what he's saying is what we do as human beings is we treat people the way that we think they'll treat us. And then we go to God and we think I've messed up, I've failed, I'm self-centered. And we think God doesn't want to have anything to do with us. And you know what God does? God tells us you're wrong because I don't do things the way you do them. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You reject people who are self-centered, I gravitate towards them. I heal them. I forgive them. I bless them. I love them. I bring them into my family. I die for them. His ways are not our ways. So the way that you actually show that you trust God, if you want to know where your faith is, do this. One, the more you understand how unexpectedly unacceptable you are to God, how, how, how self-centered you are, the more you will recognize how amazing God is. I've had this happen in my own life. And I know it sounds counterintuitive. It's like, oh, well, Travis, you want me to beat myself up? No. I want you to recognize that there is a creator of the universe that loves you so much that he's willing to bridge that gap between everything that happens from verse two to the middle half of verse four, and then everything that happens at the end of verse four, the corruption and stuff, he crosses that boundary for us. And then every time you mess up, every time you fail, and you will fail, if you wanna know where your faith is, do you talk to God or not? Do you hide from him? Do you run from him? Do you think I can't talk to him? I'm not clean, I shouldn't go to church, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that because of this sin in my life, guess what? You don't know him. But when you sin, when you fail and you go to him, you say, God, I messed up, but I know because either I said it, because Travis said it, or because I heard it in a sermon this week, or because I saw it in Isaiah 55, they said that your ways are not my ways. I know what I would do with me, but I know what you, will, you did for me and you forgive me. So will you please forgive me again? And you know what God says? I accept you. So why does he do this? Well, God has a purpose. He accepts us unexpectedly, but he also accepts us purposefully. Purposefully. Look at verse five. He accepts us pur purposefully. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from former sins. This is uh, part of this is a, is a virtue list. They're very popular in, in the ancient world. Uh, and you see it a lot in scripture. Probably the most famous uh, virtue and vice list that we have is the one in Galatians. That's the fruit of the spirit. Those are the virtues. And then the works of the flesh are the vices. And you see them all over scripture. They just kind of are, are very popular uh, during this time period. And what Peter is doing here is Peter has told us, this is what God has done for us. Now he's telling us what we should look like in response to him. What should we look like in response to him? And what he's saying is that there's these virtues that start to manifest themselves. And because we live in a post-industrial world where everything is process oriented, I do this, I do this, I do this or because we live in a post-Ikea world where I build this and then I build this and I build this all with one tool. We think, we read a list like this and we think I've got I've to start with faith and then I'm gonna add virtue and then I'm gonna add this. I don't know why I jumped there. And then I do this and then I do this. And I'm gonna build on it because we're process oriented and that's not what, what's happening here. The Holy Spirit, when you follow Jesus Christ, when you receive him as your Lord, he comes to live inside your life. And what he does is he starts directing the spiritual growth traffic in your life. And so what he does is he says, guess what? We're, we're, he's, like, he's like a personal trainer, like a spiritual personal trainer. You show up and you don't want to do push-ups. And he's like, guess what? We're doing push-ups today. You're like, I don't want to work on self-control, God. Guess what? Your doctor says you have high cholesterol. We're working on self-control these days. He starts working on us. He starts working on our life. And we want to direct it, even the impulse that you might have to be like, well, I probably should start working on self-control. Where do you think that comes from? That comes from God. That comes from the Lord saying, this is what we're going to build on. And this is why all of us as Christians look different. You have some of you that are incredibly disciplined. You're like, Bible, every morning, 5 a.m. I pray for this amount of time. And then I do this and I do this. And we all look at you and we're like, 
That's amazing. Are you a robot? But then you, who are self-controlled and disciplined, you look at some of us who have like a really vibrant relationship with God where we, we're like weeping and crying and it's a very emotional thing. And you're like, I wish I had the knowledge of God, like that intimate knowledge of God that was like that. And it's just God working in different ways in our life. One Christian is not greater than the other in that scenario. It's just God is working in different ways in your life. And so these virtues begin to manifest and it shows us that we have, uh, well, it shows us how we've responded to God. Now, I would love to sit down and do like a big breakdown of each of these ideas. Um, in fact, as we were planning our sermon this week, uh, TJ and Orlando and Jeff and I, we were talking and uh, I would love to do like a series on each one of these ideas. I think it'd be really fascinating, but I'd lo- I don't want to leave you just awash without knowing what's talked about. So uh, what he says, I'm going to walk through each of these briefly. Uh, he says faith here. Usually that means uh, trusting, believing, uh, and, and there's that there, uh, but it's probably faithfulness. Like it's commitment to the Lord. It's maintaining faithfulness to him. So you add to that faithfulness virtue. That word virtue is the same as the word excellencies before. It's the same word. And so he's saying like add qualities of God, add his characteristics. As you grow in your faith, you'll start to look more and more like him. Knowledge. Now knowledge, because again, we live in a post-enlightenment world, we think knowledge is book learning. We think if I can recite facts, if I can tell you the, the, the 66 books of the Bible, the 12 tribes of Israel, and I can tell you the kings of Israel in order, then I'm a righteous man or woman. And while I think those are handy and I, I want us to teach our kids those things, I don't think that's what this is talking about here. This is talking about that intimate, personal knowledge of Jesus Christ, drawing close to him. Do you know him, Right? Knowledge, self-control we talked about. This is controlling your impulses, controlling your desires, controlling uh, both what you say. It's not just not eating chocolate. Like it's it's all these things. So self-control and steadfastness. Steadfastness is kind of a military term. Soldiers are steadfast. They endure under hardship, right? That's why we we honor them so much. And so uh, things aren't comfortable, things aren't easy, and you continue to persevere in your faith with godliness, Godliness, we read that and we think, oh, that's like that moral character stuff that he was talking about earlier, the divine nature. No. Godliness in the ancient world, or sorry, in the Greco-Roman world, which is who this was written to, is honor for a deity and also honoring and respecting the representatives of that deity. And so in a polytheistic culture, you might honor Zeus and you would honor, say, Zeus's priests or priestesses. But because we worship a Trinitarian God, who has made man in his image, godliness now looks like honoring him, yes, but honoring human beings as well because every human being is an image bearer of God and has valid self-worth. So if you want to be godly, it's how you treat other people, which is why we get to the next point, brotherly affection. We get very specific because brotherly affection is love to other saints. Do you love the church? Do you love other believers? In the ancient world, it was very scandalous to love people that were not a part of your family to favor them, to value them without getting something in return. But he says here again, love, the last thing. Love is not a feeling, right? Love is is an action. It's a virtue. It's something that is, is a habit in your life. And so all of these things together happening are explained in the next two verses as to why we need them. Look what he says. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from becoming ineffective and unfruitful. I don't care how little ambition you have in your life. Every single person on the planet wants to mean something. You want to matter. You don't want to be forgotten. There's a reason why when we bury people, there's a reason why when we we build a columbarium, there's a reason why we do stuff like this so that we can put a little nameplate up and we can say that this person existed. And there's a reason why the desecration of graves is seen as such a heinous crime by cultures across the world. It's because we all know inherently inside of us that I should matter. I should have significance. And what Peter's telling you is, if these qualities are increasing, then guess what? You're going to be effective. You're going to be fruitful. You're going to be everything God's created to be. You're going to be flourishing in your life. But so many of us, so many of us, don't do that. So many of us don't have that in our life. Look, as as it says in verse 9, look what it says. The next verse, forever lacks these qualities, is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. 
God has a purpose in accepting you. Do you know what his purpose is? His purpose is to make you like his son. We had a question this week. What is God's greatest purpose for my life? And it's that, to make you like Jesus. That's what every single person's purpose in life is, to make you like Christ. Now, how that looks and how that manifests is definitely different. But if you want to know what God's plan is for your life, that's it. That's the goal. That's the end state, right? And you might say, well, Travis, why does God want to accept me just to transform me? That doesn't work. That doesn't sound like he's accepting me at all. Like, I want to be accepted unconditionally. Well, let me ask you this. How many people do you think get married? The bride's walking down the aisle. We're dumb, dumb, dumbing. And she's sitting there. She's like, I hope that that 20-year-old man that I'm marrying stays the same 20-year-old man for the rest of existence. I heard audible oofs. No, you are accepted so that you might grow together and mature together and change together. I always think it's, I don't want to say hilarious. I think it's interesting, not even interesting. I think it's tragic when somebody comes to me and says, <laughs> says, well, my, my, my husband or my wife, they've changed. And I'm like, well, what did you expect somebody to do for 20 years? Stay the same? Now there's bad ways to change, sure. But not change, change is bad. If you get accepted to a university, let's say you apply and the university accepts you. You're like, I got into college, great. Are you hoping to be the same person at 22 that you were at 18? The college isn't hoping for that. They're hoping to impart to you knowledge. They've accepted you so they can transform you into an adult. And some of you resist passionately. Let's say you have a disease and you get accepted into a medical trial, a drug trial. The people accepting you into that drug trial are hoping to change the nature of your body so that you will be healed. How many people would get into a drug trial and the doctor sit you down and be like, we don't really think this is going to do anything for you. We don't think it's going to change you at all. You're still going to have the disease afterwards. It's actually going to be just the same. Nobody would do it. But we desire healing. We are accepted by every single thing that accepts us. We are accepted in order to be transformed. God is no different. Somebody that does not want you to change, somebody that does not want you to grow, does not love you. They love what you do for them right now. God loves you enough to transform you, to change you. And what happens is when we don't change, when we don't transform, it's this. We've forgotten that we were cleansed from former sins. So when people remember the way that you change, the way that you transform isn't by working harder. It's not by becoming better. It's not by going through this list of virtues and assembling the Ikea of your life. That's not it. It is you remember what the gospel has done for you. You wake up and you're like, Jesus died for me today. And I can live no matter what's happening to me today. And I had some lists of things that I was like, you can try this or you can try that to remember or to not forget. And I kind of threw those out and here's why. I think you'll be better off with some real practical examples of people that I know. You want to know what this looks like? Tell you stories of young adults that are in my life right now. And this is what they're doing. One, I have a guy in my small group who so wants to know what God wants for his life. He has fasted for three days this week. He's in his 20s. I don't know any 20-year-olds fasting unless they're like trying to lose weight and he's skinny as a rail. Three days wanting to hear from God. And he showed up to small group on Wednesday night not feeling great because that was the last day. I got, an, I got couples that I talk to all the time. And when I get married and they're like, Travis, what we really care about is that the gospel is presented at our wedding. Our wedding is an opportunity for our friends that don't know the Lord to hear. It's not about the bride. It's not about the groom. It's about a greater groom and a greater bride. And we want our friends to hear it. They recognize, they remember what God has done for them and they recognize the platform they have and they want to use it. I've got another friend who carries homeless uh, uh, supplies, supplies for the homeless in his car. And he, he gives them out and he meets with them and he talks to them because he's remembered what God has done for him. I had another friend that I talked to this week and she was grieving because she works in a, uh, uh, an assisted living facility. And there's a woman there who is dying and she doesn't know the Lord and she is terrified. And my friend, again, young adult, his heart is broken and is crying over the state of this woman because she remembers. Remembering means you recognize there is no sacred secular divide. We've talked about this. It is across the board. 
every opportunity you have. Do you want to know if the spirit is moving in your life? Do you talk about him? Do you talk about God? Do you talk about what Christ has done? Do you look for opportunities? God accepts us, but he accepts us to change us and transform us. And we have to ask him to do that. But the best part is he accepts us eternally. He accepts us eternally. Look at verse 10. He accepts us eternally. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an, inher- an entrance excuse me, into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God deeply desires to accept you, to bless you, to pour out blessing in your life, in this life and the next. But notice what he says. He says, eternally. It was there a moment ago. Eternally. There it is right there, eternal. You know why I think he says eternal kingdom? He's writing to a Greco-Roman audience that lives under a Roman empire that has lasted for a really long time and will last for a long time afterwards. They think it's eternal. You know what they call Rome? You know what Rome's nickname is? It's the eternal city. And Peter's saying, nah, don't think so. The kingdom of God is what is eternal. And you can be brought in. You can be accepted. All of this that he's talking about in these last two verses, they are yours forever. And it's not that God uh, is going to just take him away. It's not that God's going to strike you down. It's not that, oh, I mess up and God kicks me out. That's not how he does. Because why? Why does he not do that? Talked about it earlier. His ways are not our ways. We let people run out of rope all the time. God's like, nope. It's effective. Peter says if we persevere in our faith, we continue to trust him, we continue to rest in him. It's not temporary acceptance. And so many of us love this idea. We love the idea of going to heaven. Woo, we love it. Especially Baptist, man. Like we've const- for, there's a whole generation of us Christians, I'm in it, that the way we came to Christ was somebody asking me, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you would, if you would go to heaven? And so what I thought as a kid, I'm like, well, it, it's a binary choice. It beats the alternative, right? There's heaven and hell. Nobody says, yeah, you know, I'm kind of, kind of really looking forward to the weather in hell. Nobody says that. See, the thing is, we want heaven. We like heaven. Sounds nice. Play golf. Enjoy it. It's going to be great. We just don't want Jesus. You see, what many of us want, we don't want acceptance. We want exceptions. We want God to look at our behavior, look at our life, look at the way we live and say, it's okay. I love you like a, like a kind old uncle who's like, oh, it's fine. Let him, let him be wild. Let him sow his oats. Let, him, let her do her thing. You know, she's a free spirit. That's what we want. We want God to accept us, not accept us. We want exceptions. We want to live how we want to live. And that's not how God works. You know why? Because he loves us too much. There's a great song by U2. It's, on the, uh, it's the last song on the Zeropa album, if you're looking for it. It's called The Wanderer. And the best part about The Wanderer is that I love Bono, but he doesn't do any of the vocals. Uh, it's all Johnny Cash. So if you've never liked you too, but you like Johnny Cash, I've got great news. But in the song, uh, uh, Johnny Cash says, they say they want the kingdom, but they don't want God in it. And that's where a lot of us live. That's where a lot of us act. That's where our culture is. We want the kingdom. We just don't want God in it. You know how the story of the Velveteen Rabbit ends? It ends with the little boy getting sick again. He gets scarlet fever. And the little boy is healed. He, he, he gets healthy again. But the doctor says, hey, in order to keep this from spreading, in order to keep this from him getting it again and all that stuff, we've got to take all of his toys, all of his stuff, and it all has to be burned. And so this dear little rabbit that he loves so much gets hauled outside, and they're just chucking toys in, and they just go into the fire. Also, this little kid doesn't get sick again because he's, the, the rabbit's now infected. And right as he's about to be thrown in to be burned... Something magical happens. He becomes a real rabbit. He becomes an in-flesh rabbit. And one day, he's hopping by where the little boy lives, and the little boy sees the bunny out in the yard. He says, oh, that looks just like my velveteen rabbit. It's a little bit of a mixed metaphor. But in a lot of ways, Jesus is that velveteen rabbit. We were sick. And because of his desire to love us, he allowed himself to become infected with what we had, and it's called sin. 
And I know it's an archaic word. I know we don't like it, but that's what it is. It's a disease. And he took it on himself. And rather than us going to the fire, he went to the fire. And God accepts his sacrifice, accepts what he does on the cross, and raises him to life. He's transformed in a glorified body, raised and resurrected. And then he comes back to us. And he offers us the same thing. He says, you can be real. You can be real. You can be more than real. You can be realer than you've ever been. Right now we feel real. And because we uh, depend so much on our five senses, we think it's God that seems so unbelievable. But we're like ghosts. We're like, like wraiths flittering through the night. And Jesus comes to us and says, I can make you real. Take my hand. All those scars, all those, that pain that you go through, all that difficulty, just as I can make you real. And you know what? Some of us sit there and we're like, how could that possibly be? Like, Travis, you don't know what I've done. You don't know who I am. Well, look at first, or second Peter. Hi there, I, I did it. Look at second Peter. Verse one, look at verse one. Look what it says. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Faith of equal standing. Do you know who Peter is? You know who writes this? Peter's an apostle. He saw the resurrected Jesus. Peter walked on water. Peter participated in feeding 5,000 people. Peter is an apostle. He is the man. If there's a Mount Rushmore of Christians, he's on it. And you read that and you think, faith of equal standing. Travis, do you know what I am? You see, so many of us get caught up in the content of our faith. What, what, how strong is my faith? That's not what gives us equal standing. It is the object of the faith that gives it equal standing, not the content. It is what you are trusting in. It's not about you. And that's what as Christians, we're here. That's why we're here every Sunday morning. That's why we brave the rain. It's why we, we canoed in this morning. Is because we're all sitting here saying, I want to be accepted by God. And I believe that it is only through Christ that he does that. I want to be made real. I want to be transformed. Because I have a faith of equal standing because it is resting on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that's it. And that's how you're accepted. That's how you're made real. That's how you're transformed. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be made real today. We can be transformed. Lord, I pray that this would be the day of salvation. For those of us in this room who are struggling, who are drowning, who are lost, who want so badly to be accepted, Lord, I pray that you would show us what that next step is so they might be accepted by you. Please work in this time.